I can hear that. <laughs> Are all our welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, this is Dottie being selfish, <laughs> having uh, these next two weeks. As some of you know, I loved and lived with a pastor, and in so doing. I learned a lot about myself and also about parishioners and one of the things I learned was that we have some expectations of our pastors that uh, are not always easy to fulfill just in reference in ways in which we say my pastor <laughs> which means you do what I want when I want <laughs> and how I want it <laughs> well, uh, and so I thought, well, let's go to the source. First, one young gal, one woman here, who is not yet officially, but why is she doing this? <laughs> and then, as I call them, the boys, <laughs> our, our pastor, <laughs> Keith and Pastor George, uh, they're gonna come next week and just have a dialogue on where they are at different points in their careers uh, and what their view is. I. As I said, I, I just think it would be healthy and good for us to hear this and to uh, maybe ask questions that will bring to us a clarity that we all are on the same team, we're all going in the same direction, uh, and we need each other. <laughs> so welcome. Here we go. <laughs> Our Kathleen. All right. I'm possessive, yes. All right. <laughs> so how about if you just start telling sure. us some of the thought processes that got you to even think about doing this? <laughs> yeah, OK. So um, I'll just start out by saying I think all of you have been in here when I've led forum before, and I've come very prepared with slides and content. That's not what's happening today. Because <laughs> um, I don't feel like I have like content to transmit to you because um, like Dottie said it's like we're just here to sort of talk about yeah like my story and what the role is and what what we're all doing here so um, I welcome all your questions and thoughts and whatever all you have um, I need just interrupt we do have a pastor sitting here with us retired well retired do you need to wear a mask Yes, she does. <laughs> yeah. okay. Can you hear me okay, Sally? Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, um, so, so then to Dottie's question, like, how did I get here? Um, I'd say that's, it's been, a, it's been a, an ongoing process. Um, so I think the thought to go to seminary first came across my plate um, when I was in college. So I spent five summers um, from the summer before my first year of college through the summer after my last year of college, so all the way through um, working at Caroline Furness Lutheran Camp, which is in Fort Valley, Virginia. Um, and it's part of the Lutheran Outdoor Ministries network. So if you all know Bear Creek or Nawakwa, any of the camps in this area, sort of in this region, Caroline Furness is associated with them. Um, and for the last two and a half years of that time, I was working part-time year-round as the summer program director. Um, and so I was in leadership in this camp ministry, and I had people telling me repeatedly, oh, you know you're going to be a pastor. You're going to go to seminary someday. And I absolutely refused. I said, nope, you're all wrong. I don't want to do that. Um, I, love, I love working at camp. I love working with kids. But I don't feel the need to be in a congregation. Um, and people didn't listen, and they kept telling me anyway that I should go to seminary. Um, why do you think they didn't listen? <laughs> yeah, that one. You know, that's a great question. <laughs> Maybe they saw something you had not yet seen. Yes. So I think I think there are several factors. Um, I think there are several factors that I wasn't quite grasping. One is that I grew up in the Missouri Synod, and so I didn't grow up knowing that women were allowed to be pastors. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And so 
I think they're there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I think um, that was subconscious at the time. That wasn't what I was thinking because by that point I had met several women pastors. Um, but I think there was a part of me that said, I don't know how to. I, I don't know that this is a thing I'm allowed to do. Um, the other piece is that I didn't picture myself in a congregation, and to be honest, I still don't. Um, and you all, you all have been extremely helpful in showing me what congregational ministry can be, um, because I, I don't feel called to a congregational context. But I, and, and so, at that time when I was in college, when people said you're going to be a pastor that was often where they sort of thought they were sending me, and I didn't want that. And that's how I heard it, too, and I didn't want that. I didn't feel called in that direction. So, but I did, over those years um, of working at camp and uh, being like a leader in my different sort of ministry settings that I was part of, um, think, you know, maybe I'm called to some sort of ministry. And so after college, um, I would, and, and so at that time, I was also, this is still true also, I'm very passionate about um, like justice and peace building um, and working across all sorts of things, uh, identities and lines that divide us, right? Um, and in particular, in college, my academic work was focused on religious conflict, violence, and peace building. Um, and so after college, <coughs> I was planning to, um, I had a job lined up in Egypt doing cross-cultural dialogue facilitation between the Coptic Christian community there and Western pilgrims. Just like we did, right? Who <laughs> <laughs> the fuck? Um, and that, that, so that was the kind of, that was the kind of sort of cross-cultural, um, like intercultural and interfaith work I was interested in doing. But um, by a series, th there was a series of sort of family crises at that same time that, uh, made it clear I needed to stay in the US and be close to my family. Um, and so then I was kind of like, well, then what am I doing, right? Like this thing that I thought I was drawn to, that I was so excited about, isn't going to work out. What am I doing? And I fell back on what I knew, which was that I love working with kids. Um, and I landed in a congregation in Chambersburg, PA, doing children, youth, and family ministry, um, which was incredible. And within two weeks, maybe less, of working there, the pastor that I worked with said, you know, you're going to be a pastor someday. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, why does everybody keep telling me this? Why can't, you know, why can't I continue doing youth ministry, continue doing interfaith, intercultural dialogue, continue doing these things I'm excited about without being a pastor? Um, but because she was convinced that I was going to be a pastor. We continued the conversations. You know, I worked there for two and a half years, um, and she was an incredible mentor and, and support for me as I sort of figured out, well, what the heck am I doing with my life? Um, and so there were lots of hard conversations, lots of tears, um, trying to figure out where I was going, what I was doing. And then I was um, at Synod Assembly, I don't know, one, one of those years. Um, and the Lower Susquehanna Synod always does ordinations at Synod Assembly. And so um, I was sitting up in the balcony, like not a part of it, very much like sitting in the back, just there because I was supposed to be. Um, and at this moment that one young woman was ordained, I just had this flash of a thought, that could be me. And I was like, I don't, I don't know why. I don't know where that thought came from. I've been like resisting this um, for so long. And, but that, that sort of moment felt meaningful. Was it like an aha? Kind of, but it was also like, come on brain, what are you doing? Like it was like, it was almost like an aha, but I still didn't want it. Could have been the Holy Spirit? Oh, Probably. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. Um, so I've been really stubborn. Is, is the moral of this story. <laughs> um, yeah. But sort of after that moment, I went back to the pastor I was working with and I said, okay, like maybe we need to talk about this more seriously. I was living very close to Gettysburg, so she and I went and visited ULS, the Gettysburg campus, and we talked to some people. I knew I didn't want to go to ULS, <laughs> um, but it was nearby. Yeah. It was nearby and it was like sort of the first, uh, the first like real step. Um, 
and she, you know, the pastor I was working with at the time pushed me, I think, just just the right amount. Like, I needed, I needed a little push, and so she, you know, took me to the seminary to meet some people, and, and we started talking um, sort of more seriously at that point. Um, but I still knew that I don't, uh, yeah, I don't feel called to, like, sort of a very conventional congregational ministry. Um, and so I started looking into, well, what other, what, what is there, right? If I'm going in this direction of ordained ministry, but I don't connect with congregational work, what else is there? Um, and the answer is there are so many things. Um, but I had to let myself believe that. Um, and so I ended up at Princeton for a number of reasons, one of which is, as some of you heard this morning, that they have this dual degree program where I can pursue an MSW and an MDiv at the same time. Um, and so that's what I'm doing now. Would you define those? Yes, yeah, so a, ma a Master of Divinity is sort of the like classic degree that people get on, on the way to ordination. Um, so that's one of the degrees I'm pursuing. And then I'm also working on a Master's of Social Work um, so that I can sort of put together these pieces of things that I'm passionate about and things that I feel called to. Um, and I felt really fortunate this year that I've been able to be in this context where I'm putting those pieces together, right? In this congregational context, <laughs> but doing justice work, doing advocacy, um, you know, s walking alongside you all as you do that work. Um, so that's been really, that's been really incredible, and, and it's helping me bridge some of those gaps that I've sort of been navigating for several years now. Um, and I, I have to say for all of you to know, <laughs> being on staff with this young woman um, has been invigorating for us. It has been challenging for us. It <laughs> has been a learning process for us. It has been loving for us. It, uh, the bonding that has occurred mm -hmm. is extraordinary. I say this each time we have a young person <laughs> coming in, but I don't care. I mean, there is just something that God draws these wonderful souls to us to not only um, for their well-being, but more so, I think, for us, what we learn. Because it, it's a different set of eyes on something that we've been looking at for years. And so when you get that other perspective, <laughs> it just opens up so many doors. Whether they know it or not, they are door openers for us. You know? <laughs> and this one is exceptional. Mm. Thank I'm you, glad Abby. to see that she's working with the youth. Mm. Oh, yes. she's exceptional. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a genuine, true devotion. <laughs> you know, because a lot of times people are pulled, kicking and screaming <laughs> into <laughs> working with kids. Yeah. Dear God. Yeah. You know, when having been a former teacher and now <laughs> connected with catechetics, it's one of the best things that can ever happen to you. <laughs> one of the best things. So, I have a question. Absolutely. So, what were you majoring in in college then? Was it like? So, I was a religion major, and I have. I also had most of a sociology major. I didn't quite finish all the requirements for the second major, um, but it was. I was sort of always coming at my religion major from a sociological lens. Um, and so, yeah, so I wrote a thesis. So, okay, I spent a semester in Jerusalem um, and uh, had already been studying, had already been studying um, religious conflict and peace building and sort of the angles from which um, communities come at conflict and peace building. Um, and, and so it, since that was something I was excited about, also, I had taken Hebrew on a whim because of who I am as a person. Um, I love languages. That's like one little like Kathleen nerd thing that you all haven't like necessarily gotten, uh, hasn't come up as much. But um, I love languages, so I took Hebrew on a whim because it was a language I had never tried before, um, and loved it. And so um, anyway, sort of those pieces came together to make me say, oh, well, I should probably study abroad in Jerusalem given the opportunity. And I was given the opportunity. So spent time there in an interfaith, intercultural community, um, you know, wrestling with all of the dynamics of conflict and um, living day to day in a tense context and um, having Jewish and Israeli friends and Palestinian and Muslim friends and um, I was in a church community that 
brings together Palestinian and international Christians. Um, and so just sort of like having barely, having, having my fingers barely, because I was only there for four months, but barely sort of touching in these different communities, I, was, I, I needed more of it. I like, craved more of it. And so I ended up writing a thesis um, on religious conflict violence and peace building in Israel and Palestine, um, and specifically focused on um, organizations on either end of the spectrum from different religious traditions. So a Jewish, Muslim, and Christian organization each that um, promoted violence, and one from each faith tradition that promoted peace building, um, and how the, the resources from within those traditions that they use to support and further their cause. Um, so that's a very long answer to your question. I was a religion major <laughs> with sort of like a niche focus. Mm -hmm. You see why we love her. <laughs> <laughs> serious, I'm being serious here. She has such depth, and that's a gift. Can you tell us where you grew up and a little bit about your family? Absolutely. So I grew up in um, the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia. Um, and um, yeah, my family, <laughs> It depends how much, how long an answer you want about my family. Um, it's complicated. It is complicated. Yeah. Um, so I grew up very close to my mom's side of the family. Um, my mom's family is from a little tiny town in the Alleghenies called Accident, Maryland. Um, the name tells you what you need to know. <laughs> uh, and they, and people don't tend to leave Accident. Um, it's a, a small rural farming community. Um, and so my entire family, for the most part, uh, my mom's entire family mostly still lives there. And we spent a lot of time with our cousins, helping on the farm. My grandparents, my grandma still lives on the farm, the family farm, although she doesn't run it anymore. My uncles are the primary farmers these days. But um, so, so we, we grew up working on the family farm. My cousins were a very tight-knit unit. Um, and that side of the family are German Lutherans all the way back, except the ones that are German Mennonites. Um, so <laughs> um, I grew up in this rural, uh, very sort of politically and socially conservative um, mountain farm <laughs> community. And was um, raised in the Missouri Synod. And was raised in the Missouri Synod, yep. Poor thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> my dad, on the other hand, uh, my dad, my dad's dad was a Presbyterian pastor. And um, my dad was one of those PKs who, as soon as he was old enough to get out of the house, he said, I want no more of this. <laughs> um, and so my parents had sort of an understanding that mom took us to church and dad kept his mouth shut. <laughs> um, and um, so then by the time I was like a teenager and was asking some of the big questions and was wrestling with, you know, what do, what do I make of all this? Um, I had these two very different voices answering those questions depending on who I asked and how I asked it. Um, and because of our family dynamic, I was much closer with my mom's side of the family. Um, be because my dad's family is spread out all over the country and the, the world, really. Um, his mother was, the, uh, was raised in China. Um, her parents were missionaries. And so when they came back to the US, so they only came to the US because the Japanese invaded. Um, otherwise, they would have stayed. And so she, no, she was already back in the US to come to college. But her mother and sisters were on the last boat out of the port before they closed the Chinese ports. Wow. Um, and so since it was sort of a move of desperation, that family kind of like scattered um, wherever they could go. So one of them was married to a Canadian, ended up in Canada. Um, some of them ended up in Australia for a while before coming back to the US. So it was just kind of like wherever they could go that was safe at the time. Um, so my, all that to say, my dad's side of the family is, is very scattered, whereas my mom's side is very unified. And so I grew up in this one cultural context, even though my family has both, or has m multiple. Um, Your brothers and sisters. I have two older sisters. Um, yeah, so I'm the youngest also, which is definitely part of the di dynamic. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I don't know what the conclusion to those thoughts is, but that's a little bit about my family. <laughs> The conclusion is this is just who you are. Yeah, it is. It is. I've got lots of different pieces. Yeah. And you have many years to be <laughs> So when was the revelation that you needed to get out of Missouri Synod? Um, so I had... <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. Yes, I do. 
<laughs> so the, the particular congregation I grew up in um, had a lot of <laughs> challenging internal politics. Um, so when I was like in middle school, um, there was a pastor who was about to be ousted and quit instead um, after like a series of unfortunate events. Um, and so I sort of, and that, those were in my formative years, right? And so I saw this happening and I was like, mom, why do you want to be a part of this? Like, this is just awful. Um, and so I think I sort of had the idea. So that gave me the idea that the institutional church was worth scrapping, right? I was like, not, none of this is salvageable. It's all terrible. Um, and um, so then I, my junior year of high school, I had the opportunity to be an exchange student in France. And um, so I was living in France for a year with a family who um, were from the Caribbean. And they were part of a church, like a Pentecostal-ish um, congregation that was made up primarily of African and Caribbean immigrants. And so that was a radically different yeah. cultural experience than the churches I had grown up in. Um, and so that sort of, <coughs> it, didn't, it didn't by any means answer my questions. Um, but it at least gave me a different conception of what the church could be. Um, and so I was like, okay, like not all churches are terrible like the one I grew up in. This one had its own problems, certainly. Um, but I learned a lot and mostly just I think, I think my, my conception of what the church could be was really broadened in that context. Um, and so, um, and, and so I think that was the beginning. <laughs> Um, I had also, uh, my parents, my parents have friends whose daughter worked at Caroline Furness, the same camp, uh, when I was a kid. And so our, my, our parents sent us to camp as a kid just because they knew, that, you know, our babysitter, the person who had been our babysitter when she was in high school was on staff there when she was in college kind of thing, with uh, this connection, this family connection. So I had been sent to this ELCA camp when I was growing up and loved it. It was this safe place, this loving place where I could be myself, um, where like no question is off limits, um, you know, everything is open for wrestling. Um, and so I was looking for a summer job my senior year of high school and my mom was still on the Caroline Furness email list um, from all those years previously and had said, hey, they're looking for summer staff. What do you think? And so it really, like, I think it was sort of a confluence of things. Um, but uh, yeah, then being in this camp context again as an adult, it was all the things I had remembered from childhood, but of course also all sorts of other things because you're sort of seeing behind the curtain um, <laughs> once you're on staff. <laughs> um, and, and so it was like, okay, this is still this loving place, this safe place. But it's also really challenging, and it, there's also all these other dynamics, and working at camp is exhausting. You are nonstop all day long. Um, I wrote a letter to my mom, my first, like, wh wh the week that I had my first cabin of campers <laughs> that were, like, mine. I had eight girls between six and eight. And I wrote a letter to my mom that was just like apologizing for everything I had ever done. <laughs> <laughs> um, because it's exhausting and I can I don't I don't understand how parents do it. You all, everyone in this room who has children has my utmost respect. Um, so um, so so it was like then camp sort of having the second experience of camp was like the maybe the third piece in like an ongoing, a third or fourth or who knows how many actually piece in an ongoing um, learning process that um, there was, there were churches that were less toxic than the one I grew up in. <laughs> <laughs> so how about, um, I have a question. Yeah. Just real quick. How do you feel about the concept that successful churches the more successful a church is, the more it resembles summer camp. <laughs> a variety of experiences. My gut reaction is absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but that's because camp was my formational place. It's a formational um, place for a lot of yeah. clergy. Is what I'm yeah. saying. And we get into the congregation and we fall into old patterns yep. to keep the institution going and mm -hmm. we forget about the joy of mm -hmm. summer camping. Uh, so yeah. Good point. I absolutely. Yeah. I'm there. 
I would be I would be willing to engage with people who disagree, um, but I I'm inclined to say, absolutely. I, I could just throw <laughs> an insight in with this that that many do not know, not because bad people, you're just not privy to this. There's a lot of business stuff <laughs> that accompanies running a church. It's not just preaching on a Sunday or yeah. faith formation, which I'm a part of, but minutia yeah. of business of ministry that is Amen. exhausting. Yeah. It's also challenging because it is rife with conflict mm -hmm. uh, of people having different views as to how th right. things business-wise or should run. But you know, when you have any group of people, I don't care if it's a church or it's office or it's a school faculty or uh, people at the bus stop, you, you have these things that just morph and, and evolve. Mm -hmm. And so my question to you is, is seminary doing anything to make <laughs> you more aware of that than certainly when my husband went through, maybe Paul as well, or, uh, and you my know. My dad was a Senate president. <laughs> no. Oh, God. Oh, there you go. There you go. Oh, God. Yeah, so what's your take? Um, so I do think, I would say different seminaries handle that differently. Um, Princeton is certainly equipping people for congregational ministry and other types of ministry, but it's also equipping people to be academics. Um, there are a lot of, a lot of my classmates are intend to go on to PhD work. Um, and so... To teach? Yeah. Uh, or, you know, research or whatever. Um, and so... It vastly depends. I think the ELCA seminaries and other seminaries that are like sort of more um, focused on training congregational pastors um, do more of that, the ins and outs, the nuts and bolts of things. You hope. Um, yeah, you so, hope. Uh, what? You hope they I do. hope. Yes, I hope. I get the impression, maybe, okay. um, that, they, that they're trying. We <laughs> might hear more about that next week. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in my context, it, it really depends what classes you're taking, um, and, and because some of them are more focused on sort of those details of things, and some are much more big ideas, philosophy, theology, um, which certainly other seminaries are doing as well. I don't mean to say they're not. Um, so I, I personally have gotten most of that here in this context, right? Do it, just doing it <laughs> in practice. Um, yeah, best way to learn. Yeah, and, and I, what I found this year is that I am making all sorts of connections between my coursework and what I'm doing here. Mm -hmm. It's just here, it's boots on the ground, ins and outs, daily details, which, yeah. But, you know, so much of that, like with the RIC team, for instance, I was able to say, okay, actually, this is from undergrad, not from seminary, but okay, I have this training in nonviolent communication. We're having these really hard conversations with people going through the RIC process. What if I bring some of that to the table? Um, you know, so, so, so things like that that I have in my background um, from, undergrad, from undergrad or camp or seminary or wherever else um, to say, okay, I don't, I don't have experience with this, you know, minute detail of congregational ministry, but I can bring what I have from elsewhere and sort of mess it out. And I'm constantly, like, messing it out, right? Like, it's all... I'm making it up as I go along, but I like have some pieces that I can draw from. It's kind of called life. Yeah. <laughs> so Kathleen, are you saying in your personal experience, learning the organizational dynamics part of being a pastor, not the theological mm -hmm. or the sociological, mm -hmm. but the, the, the mechanics mm -hmm. of running an, a formal organization, mm -hmm. Your learning has been OJT, on-the-job training, yeah. as opposed to it's called any, any <laughs> kind of instruction. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, some of it, so, so certainly some of these things come up in my classes, absolutely. Um, so I'm in a class right now, I was just telling Pastor George about it earlier. I'm in a class right now that's like structured around case studies. So it's lots of theological and biblical reading, but then the dis our course, dis our like class discussions are, here's a case study from a real congregation that our professor or one of his colleagues has served, and what theological and biblical resources do you bring to this very real practical problem in a congregation? So we do talk about those things in, some, in, in, our, in my coursework. I think my question is mm -hmm. along a different tangent, okay. and that is just running any formal organization, yeah. hiring, firing, mm -hmm. OSHA, insurance, yeah. risk management, yeah. 
uh, you know. Um, and that's all here. Yeah. Well, and my yeah. point is, do, is there any resource for the, the seminaries to do anything to teach that? And I would doubt that at least ULS, because mm -hmm. one of the things I did when I first retired was I wanted to take classes at the mm -hmm. seminary, which I did, mm -hmm. and I took classes in you know Lutheran confessional writings mm -hmm. and church history and stuff. I didn't see anything in the catalog about mm. running a church. And I don't think that's, that's not to pick on seminaries mm -hmm. or the church, because I think it's kind of common. And I think Chris will probably uh, validate what I'm about <laughs> to say. When Don went to four years of veterinary school in Minnesota, mm. there was not one bit mm. of instruction on hiring and firing and OSHA. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and yeah. she had to learn that all. Yeah. Seminars, seminars put on yeah. by AVMA, where you learn the nuts and bolts of all yeah. that stuff. But these professional schools, mm -hmm. and I can't speak for medical schools mm -hmm. or you know law schools, but I, they're great on the theory. <laughs> but, but on the, they the, do more of that now. I mean, you, you think so? I've been out twenty-five years or so. Yeah, so is Dawn. Yeah. I, I think so. I, I think they're getting better with it. Yeah. yeah I uh, so I would say I learned. So working at camp, um, I was on a staff of three, um, and so that's all. Yeah. Uh, so so summer staff, the like twenty college students, oh, summer okay. staff. Okay. But the year-round staff, right? Gotcha. The the people gotcha. doing the admin side of things. There, it's a very tiny group. But you're talking summer. No, no, no. summer <laughs> staff. There are like many more. Um, but it was the executive director, the office manager, and me year-round, um, and I was very part-time and working remotely because I was also in school. Um, and so I think I learned a lot of that in that context simply because there were not enough people to divide the labor. So you acquired it on your own. Yeah, so I learned a lot of it in that context. And then I was in a, I worked in another congregation before starting seminary, and so I learned a lot of it there. Again, a small staff, right? I worked with one pastor, one music director, and an office person. Um, and so, I've learned a lot of that just from my other experiences, but yeah, I wouldn't say the majority of that happens in seminary. I've also learned a ton of it here, right? This is a much larger organization than either camp or the pre my previous congregation, um, and so it looks different here, um, even though this is still a very small organization. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. each congregation is structured differently. Um, well, that's reassuring, because you've, yeah. you, you have certainly done a good job of taking advantage yeah. of the opportunities yeah. you have here. Yeah. Yeah, so, but no, I, I wouldn't say that that's like a focus. There's, there might be like a class or two um, that sort of talks about some of those things. But I think part of it also is that seminary, while yes, absolutely training people, people for congregational ministry, is also trying to train people to send them out to whatever they might end up in, right? There are all these different fields of ministry. Like I said, some people, a lot of my classmates are going on to be academic, want to go on to be academics. Um, and so there are like lots of different avenues that people might take. And like, while it is a professional degree program, right, that's training you for a certain profession, it's also a generalist sort of training, right? Because they, they want you to be able to go out and do any number of things. Okay. Anything, um, either life experience or uh, professional learning, mm -hmm. uh, has any of it dealt with just understanding people and having, <laughs> having success with uh, confrontation, mm -hmm. because that comes with the package, mm -hmm. my friends, if you're not aware of it. <laughs> uh, 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 surprise, uh, surprise. Uh, 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 you're around naughty, though. <laughs> 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 I, I can't tell the <laughs> <laughs> I will ask this question. <laughs> Who has your back more? <laughs> my back. <laughs> there you go. No, but what I'm saying is that uh, a successful life mm -hmm. you know, is defined many ways, mm -hmm. but in terms of leadership, mm -hmm. it's understanding the fact that you're in a place that the other person has never been. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it's your responsibility to take the higher road, mm -hmm. even though at times that can be very frustrating. But that's just one component of understanding mm -hmm. skills and dealing with people, you know, and, and I, I, I just wish that there be here's my background psychology I wish there'd be more psychology mm -hmm. in the seminary mm -hmm. to teach how God wants us to get along mm -hmm. you know and it's a simple word of being kind mm -hmm. 
and sometimes that disappears. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I, I would wish that for you, mm -hmm. for anybody. Yeah, I would say everything I've done has, like e every experience I've had in my life, um, and certainly sort of as I've been working in ministry, um, even more so, has helped me understand people and helped me understand how much I don't understand other people sometimes. <laughs> of course, um, of course. But that's also my angle, right? I love people. That's like that's what I am interested in is working with people. Um, actually, this is sort of a tangent, but I just like two days ago I was having a conversation with um, someone I know at the seminary who's deaf and uses ASL. My ASL is very mediocre. I'm I really struggle to communicate with him, um, and so we were talking. Did you define that for people? ASL American Sign Language. Sign language. Um, so that's his that's his first language. My friend Noah. Um, and um, he's a PhD student at the seminary. Um, and I, he's very patient. He's, he also teaches ASL at Princeton University. Um, so he is like, he's very familiar with people who are just learning ASL, right? He's, he knows how to be patient. He has the attitude of a teacher, um, and, which is great for me because I, I sign really, really slowly. Um, but we were talking the other day about, um, like he was asking me what, I, what I'm, trying to do after seminary. He's like, you know, what brings you here? What are you heading toward? And all I could communicate with my very rudimentary ASL was like, I want to work with people. And he says, so what does that look like? What's that like? And I was like, I don't know, but with people, like with, like with the emphasis on with, right? And what I was able to sign is like, not beside people. Um, and, 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 and that's like a very sort of like rudimentary, a explanation of it, I think, because my language skills are so so minimal. Um, but but I think it summarizes it well, right? That I want to work with people, people and and that's it. and that's yes. what I'm passionate about. Um, and so personally, and you I say you work with respect. You do. That's my goal. <laughs> um, and so personally, I would say I'm, I'm constantly learning that. Um, I think in terms of like sort of specific areas of formation that are geared toward that. A big one is clinical pastoral education, which I did last summer. I was a um, hospital chaplain intern for the summer. Um, and that's a big part of that program. Because you just walk into a hospital room, you don't know the person, you know their name, um, and, and that's about it, right? And so I was um, primarily on labor and delivery and in the ER which are both places where people don't stay very long, right? So some of my, some of the members of my cohort were, you know, on intensive care or extended stay units and they got to build relationships with their patients. I saw pa most of my patients once. Um, and so I walk into a room, no idea what I'm gonna find, no idea what they're gonna be going through, and I just sit with them. Um, and, and I think that was huge in that, um, in learning, in working on that, those skills. Of course. And, and then I would also say that in some of my pastoral care classes, Specifically, like there is this psychological basis of okay, what do people need developmentally, emotionally, right? Like, like understanding people geared toward how do we care for those needs. So, I think so, I would, there's like a combination of things, but it's also because that's what I'm interested in. It's okay. I, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So I, as you've been going through this, you you were saying mm -hmm. that you know people kept saying, oh, you should be a pastor, you should do this, you should do mm -hmm. that. Yeah. As you've been going. Through mm -hmm. Princeton and, mm -hmm. and doing your field work and chaplaincy and mm -hmm. things like that, have you felt your call confirmed? <laughs> have the, has it raised more questions for you? Um, Both. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I am constantly asking myself why I'm here and what I'm doing, mm -hmm. um, but I'm also constantly finding joy and meaning in what I'm doing. Um, so I sort of just take it one step at a time. And like, if tomorrow the answer is I can't do this anymore, that's fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm just, I'm just along for the ride. <laughs> you think that, I mean, to me, the options that are open to you now mm -hmm. probably are much more diverse oh, than yeah. what they used to be in yes. the years ago. So mm -hmm. I think probably that gives yeah. you some hope that you mm -hmm. can find something. That yeah, I mean, if I get if I get burnout on the church, which yeah. like 
Some days come really close. Um, <laughs> you yeah. can escape to Egypt. Exactly. <laughs> right? I, can, I can do any of these other no things. French. Right. I can work in social agencies. You know, in nonprofit in the nonprofit world. Like, there's lots of things I could do. So. You know, and what the two of you are saying is is how we all need to live. That no matter what we are doing, <coughs> God is working through us. And so whether you're in the pulpit, which you do quite well, by the way, or, yes. you know, yes. someplace yes. else, mm -hmm. that's, not, that's not making a choice, well, I'm not going to, you know, serve God in the right way. Mm -hmm. You continue to serve, and mm -hmm. he continues to be right beside mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I, I think, too, that we... You know, we need to look at that just in our lives, mm -hmm. how people are choosing to live. Yeah. Whether it's different from ours or not, it doesn't make any difference. You won't catch me quoting Luther much. I'm not one of those people, mm -hmm. but I will for a moment. Um, so Luther's whole thing was serving God in whatever our vocation is, right? And so when he wrote, like, when he, like everything he wrote, all of the educational material that he, you know, put in German so that average people could access it, all the, you know, all the things. His his goal was to get it into people's homes, get it into their workplaces, just like into their real life. Um, and and I take that really seriously, right? That it's like a pastor is not any spe any more special or any more holy or serving God any more meaningfully than anyone else. You want to repeat that? <laughs> um, oh, all the time. Um, <laughs> Right, and it's it's that we all serve God in whatever our vocations are, whether you're a pastor or a nurse or a teacher or a garbage collector or a truck driver or whatever. Um, <coughs> like, all those vocations are meaningful, um, and so yeah, wherever I go, whatever I end up doing, that's how I approach it. Give the spirit some credit. He put about a thousand people yeah. in the path. And they all told you that you were going to be a pastor. So <laughs> if you, whenever you're not in, whenever you're in doubt about your career yeah. choice, just remember those voices mm -hmm. that encouraged you along the way. Because yeah, that's there's yeah. a lot of gifts yeah. to share. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and for those of us who are sitting in the pew, maybe to readjust our expectations and, and look within ourselves of how the Holy Spirit is working with us and, you know, not to elevate nor to denigrate, mm -hmm. you know, the person in the pulpit. Mm -hmm. We're both mm -hmm. listening to following <laughs> the same, the same yeah. Lord. And that person in the pulpit is listening to yeah. himself or herself speak at the same time. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. exactly. Because we have, of all people, need them. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. when, when what you said at the beginning, some people weren't here yet, but you talked about my pastor. Mm. Oh, and if yeah. we could just erase that. And whenever <laughs> we speak, we talk about our pastor. Mm. It brings a whole nother, mm -hmm. it brings all of us into the room. Yeah. My is, makes it very singular mm -hmm. and uh, very possessive. Yeah, and self serving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I chose to say that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we do make reference to my pastor. Mm -hmm. I do it all the time. I want you to meet my pastor. <laughs> <laughs> our pastor. I have this. Mm -hmm. I have to, language is powerful, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, language is powerful. How about uh, you share with us one of your joys? In general, <coughs> in how you've been listening to God mm -hmm. and serving Him in ways that have been so, mm -hmm. like, for instance, you know, when you've been abroad. Hmm. Hmm. Don't take my having to think about it as <laughs> an indication that I can't think of one. It's that there are too many and I'm not sure where to start. Um, I think probably, like, this seems like a like, cheap, easy answer, but, like, any time I get to have a conversation with anyone, and especially with kids who are just like genuinely, meaningfully being themselves, right? And feel safe and loved in that context to be authentic and to be authentically themselves. Um, and so I think it especially happens with kids because they haven't learned to be self-conscious yet, um, but it's happened in moments this year with the RIC team 
Um, it's happened. Um, the story that Pastor Keith told, if you're at 830 worship, about ice skating with the youth, there were definitely moments there, right, where I was we were skating around the rink, and every time I caught up to somebody, we would chat. And those were incredible conversations. Um, you know, I, like, probably first realized that this was what I was experiencing when I was working at camp. Um, I can think of a Bible study that was, you know, like, I, don't, I have no idea what we were supposed to be reading or talking about, but it went off the rails, and we talked for three hours about this one teenager's, um, like, deeply, deeply held anxieties about her family, and it was like, okay, this is what we need to do right now. Um, so, yeah, any, any of those moments where I'm able to help create a space for people to be themselves and feel safe and loved. Well, what the common denominator mm -hmm. of what you were saying, and what you've said this mm -hmm. whole time, is people. Yeah, you I know, love people. Yeah, and <laughs> I, well, <laughs> well, that's good because <laughs> no matter where you're going to be, how <laughs> you're going to serve, mm -hmm. it is with, with people, and you know, it make and life a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it it does. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if any of you have ever encountered a curmudgeon. I love that word, by the way. <laughs> you know, that no matter what you say or what you do, they're just so unhappy, and you reach, you hit the wall, and you think, all right, screw you, and you just walk away. You know, mm -hmm. think, I, you know, but most of us are not like that. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's the joy. So. I'm Glad you answered as you did, yeah. and I thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank thank you. you. Thank you. It is that time. It is that time. I'm <laughs> conscious of that because you have to get up in the <laughs> up in the altar.